All righty. Well, my clock says 12 o'clock, and I think we are ready to get started. Good afternoon to everyone. First and foremost, uh, I just want to let you know that I'm in a good space right now because my granddaughter just gave me a good luck hug because she knew what I was about to do, and that's going to make it all right for me going through. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's Crisis Jam, the learning community. I'm Dr. Brian Sims. I'm currently the Senior Medical Advisor for the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, or otherwise known as NASHBID. And I will be your host for this session. I ask you all to just bear with me as I go through this. I'm following the footsteps of some folks that I cannot even begin to be compared to with regards to Laura and to Vic and to some of the others, and of course, David uh, as well. So I'm honored and thrilled to be hosting this particular session. And what we're hoping to do in this timeline is get a lot of things accomplished. So we have some spectacular folks lined up for today, featuring, of course, our first uh, speaker. And we're going to kind of do it in a different way. We're actually going to do our featured presentation at the beginning. And then we'll go to the updates as we progress uh, through the discussions. So uh, in a few moments, we'll be moving to our speaker for today is Dr. Amy Cohen uh, with the SMI Advisor. And she will be giving her uh, preview of all of the things that she's going to be presenting to us today. So I, I thank you all for joining us. Uh, and we are looking forward to a really robust discussion throughout this particular time. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. All righty. On this slide, what we wanted to do is just kind of update you to let you know you've seen this slide many times before. And we just wanted to make sure you were aware that it's a fluid uh, sign. It's really showing that there has been movement in a positive direction. We're now up to 58 in terms of national organizations. There's also been improvements with regards to the Medicaid states as far as how they are participating. You can see from this slide. Uh, how many have actually been added to the list. Uh, the participation has been phenomenal. And we are really looking at the fact that this is not only a very needed community uh, discussion that we've been having, but you can see uh, in addition to the states, we are also getting a lot of participation from other countries, Australia, Canada, New Netherlands and UK. And I'll speak a little bit more about Nashville's affiliation in that regard but it is showing that this particular jam session has developed a tremendous amount of support. And we're so thankful to all of you for joining us at this time. Uh, next slide, please. This is our crisis talk line. This is something available to everyone. If you come into the crisis line, what you will see here are a number of resources that are readily made available to you. If you would like to have weekly reminders or something through the newsletter, uh, you can also go through the links. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, you can go down and take a look at some of the various uh, sessions that have already taken place. And as you can see on this slide, uh, the session that we just had uh, just last week is available for your review. I would also ask, and I'm sorry, going back to the slide that just talked about the number of states that have joined, if any of you have not yet uh, been joined into uh, that state count, we ask you please to get in contact with us so that we can update that. So you can go ahead uh, to the next slide, please. And the one after that. Great. So this is a wonderful slide. I love this particular slide because it's so chock full of information. Maybe not in the beginning as you're looking at the scaling graph that's kind of going up and down, but as we add more meat to it, what you will see is that it provides you a breakdown of those 360 some odd individuals who are now part of this learning community and how they're broken down. What you're seeing is that we have a number of individuals that represent national organizations, provider organizations, uh, the organizations and the lived expertise group. That is so wonderfully important to have as a part of it. In addition, we see the office behavioral health leaders and uh, I think there's one more to add in there. I don't, there we go. Okay, as far as state staff and looking at researchers. And then at the top right, what you'll see is also the inclusion of SAMHSA and NASHBIT uh, groupings 
and the court and legal consultants, uh, and of course, our uh, very noteworthy colleagues with vibrant and uh, health plans and policies and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here we have our quote for the day, and this is really coming from Roadrunners uh, and uh, in, involving the role and impact of law enforcement in terms of transporting individuals with severe mental illness. And as you uh, have seen through the theme throughout, it has been about crisis intervention and having that first stage be that kind of connection that is going to be helpful in really taking an individual's needs into account. And what you notice from this is that 70% of the law enforcement individuals from this particular study show that they're dispatched uh, in terms of responding to mental health crisis calls. And 30% of them are unplanned encounters while they're on patrol. Next slide, please. And the quote itself for today is, the survey results indicate that 10% of law enforcement agencies' total budgets was spent on responding to and transporting persons with mental illness in 2017. Phenomenal to take home that data. Next slide, please. We are now at the level of moving to our featured speaker for the day. I am so proud and so honored to present to everyone uh, Dr. Amy Cohen, who will be presenting today on routinizing crisis planning. And at this juncture, she is well known to us, well known to NASPED. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to her and considering the timelines, I'm looking forward to wonderful. So Amy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of this discussion and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate that. Um, so I'm a longtime lurker on this call, first time presenter. Uh, so happy to be here today and a little unusual. Usually we warm up to the featured presentation. So, uh, so we'll just kick it off here. Um, I am joined today by Joyen Yang, um, who will be presenting with me. She's the project manager for SMI Advisor um, and I'm the director of this group. Um, and we're gonna talk today, just, I'm gonna introduce you just to a tidbit about SMI Advisor, but then really focus on our work about routinizing crisis planning and hoping to leverage the expertise of this group to think about where we're going with this. Next slide. So SMI Advisor is actually um, formally called the Clinical Support System for Serious Mental Illness. Uh, we are a SAMHSA funded initiative implemented at the American Psychiatric Association. We are currently beginning year four of five years of funding. Next slide. So here's our vision statement at SMI Advisor. Um, our goal is to transform care for people who have serious mental illness so they can live their best lives. We define serious mental illness um, um, as major depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. Um, you know, I'm speaking to the choir here. Um, many, many people on this call um, have started their careers and spent decades um, with this same exact vision. And so we are just a piece of the puzzle um, and, and proud to be part of it. Next slide. So we uh, really focus on the SMI care team. That is um, here you can see doctors, nurses, um, uh, counselors, PharmD, social workers. Also we have representation from those with lived experience, both as family members and as individuals. Next. Next. Uh, so we offer three um, areas of support to the field. Um, you can do two more clicks. Thank you. So we, um, we offer free education. Uh, these are webinars as well as virtual learning collaboratives for deep dives. We offer evidence-based resources. And I say here vetted because we can all do Google searches and there's just a wealth of information out there. We vet every single resource with two experts on our uh, clinical expert team before they're offered to the field. And to be vetted, they have to be applicable to SMI, be evidence-based, um, and be um, appropriate for frontline clinicians. And lastly, we offer direct consultation to clinicians. Again, this is free um, and we respond within 24 hours on a working day. So again, um, I just wanna put this out there um, that we are here to, uh, to support the field and many on this call are leaders in the field and um, we would love for you to spread information about what we offer. Next slide. 
I just want to say there's two ways to reach us at SMI Advisor and to um, access the um, um, to access the um, offerings that we have. We have a website, smiadvisor.org, um, and to date we've had over a million visits to our website. Um, you'll see there on the picture, there's two tiles on the front, one for clinicians and providers and one for individuals and families. And you can enter either side um, and access our assets. I also want to say that we have an app. Who doesn't have an app these days? But we have an app, at S and you can download it at smiadvisor.org forward slash app. This is our SMI Advisor app. Um, this is where we have everything that we have on the website, but also we have some gold standard assessments. You can see here PHQ-9, GAD-7, and a few others um, where the clinician can use it right in the clinical encounter. The, um, the gold standard assessments, you're able to um, enter your responses, it scores automatically and offers interpretation automatically. So um, we would uh, you know, love for individuals on this uh, group to spread the word about um, accessing our assets. Next slide. Now, in 2019, in the previous administration, when Dr. McCann's Katz was the head of SAMHSA, she came to SMI advisor and said, I really want to move the needle more on crisis planning. And maybe she had the vision of what was coming. Um, and so she really said, I want you to think about ideally a technology supported way to improve um, the building and implementation of psychiatric advanced directives. So we began to think about building a way to build a crisis plan first with treatment preferences, and then a way for individuals to turn that crisis plan into a legal psychiatric advanced directive recognized by their state of residence. And additionally, we wanted an easy way and ideally multiple ways for them to be able to share their pad that they develop with their trusted supports, which may also include their clinical team, um, it may include family, but it may include supports that they define in their own way. But again, the individual creating the pad has the power to share it. Next slide. We wanted to consider a few things in the development. One, we wanted it to be compatible both with iOS and Android platforms. And we wanted to consider reading level, literacy, and any cognitive deficits that are often uh, can be associated with the disorders that we were thinking about. Um, and we wanted to have avoid any data saved in the cloud. Next slide. We knew that we were not alone in this effort, that many people have made incredible strides around psychiatric advanced directives and crisis um, planning. And we went to many of those people in the field and said, please help us build this in the best way possible. We relied heavily on the National Resource Center on Psychiatric Advanced Directives, including Marvin Schwartz. We went to the National Alliance on Mental Illness to look at each um, screen to make sure that the reading level and the approach would be um, palatable to our audience. We also leveraged the expertise of Deb, Deb Pinels um, at the University of Michigan Medical School. Next slide. We also went directly to the field, the people who are in touch with those who may want to create a psychiatric advanced directive. And we, we um, engaged with three pilot sites. And we engaged with these sites um, through Nashbit. They really helped us identify the sites um, that we might um, connect with. So here are the three sites, uh, two in South Dakota, one in Georgia, and they really gave us feedback on platform compatibility, printing and transforming pads, overcoming hesitancy to even create a pad, um, both by staff and by clients, and also to help socially isolated clients think about who would be a good witness to their pad or a decision maker. And I would say that what we developed was so improved by these three pilot sites. Um, and I'm so proud of what we developed. And I'm gonna let um, Joanne Yang, who really led the development and the pilot testing of this, walk you through a little bit about our app. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, next slide, please. So we created the My Mental Health crisis plan app for two use cases. Um, individuals can create a pad for themselves or a facilitator can help a client create a pad. So a facilitator in this case can be anyone on the mental health care team who can help the client think through the treatment decisions in the pad. 
Um, when you start creating a pad in the app, you can select pad for me or pad for someone else. When selecting pad for me, you will be able to complete the form, sign it in the app, and save a PDF version that you can share with your trusted supports and treatment team. This is intended for when the individual is creating the pad on their own private uh, mobile device. Um, additionally, we want to encourage facilitators to help people create pads as a routine part of care. And this can happen in both inpatient and outpatient settings. That's why we created an option for facilitators to use the app on a shared device at their practice, securely transfer the data onto the client's mobile device and easily delete the data from the shared device so that they can help other clients. We recognize how important facilitators can be for increasing the use of PADS. So we have also published a step-by-step -step guide for facilitators that I will be happy to share via email after this call. Next slide. So this slide shows a snapshot of the PAD form in the app. Uh, the user can designate their emergency contacts and supports such as friends, family, and treatment providers. Um, the user's own device, as long as the PAD data is saved, their emergency contacts are also saved. And there is this cool feature called I am in crisis that allows the user to create a pre-written text message that they can send to their uh, contacts with the click of a button. Um, the remainder of the form asks the user to state their preferences for treatment, including treatment facilities, uh, types of treatment, healthcare professionals, and medications. They can list what they want and also what they do not want. The PAD form is modeled after a template developed by the Bazelon Center for Mental Health. And as Amy mentioned, we worked with experts from NAMI to make the language person-centered and easier to understand. Next slide. When the user has completed the PAD form, they have created a crisis plan. Um, so for the crisis plan to become a legally valid psychiatric advance directive, there are additional steps like getting witness signatures and possibly getting the document notarized. These rules vary by state. So the last step of the PAD form, um, the user can select their state of residence and view the steps needed in their state to turn the crisis plan into a PAD. The user can also directly sign in the, in the pad or in the app, I'm sorry, and also get their witnesses to sign in the app if they are available. If not, the user can download a PDF of the crisis plan and have their witnesses sign at a later time. Next slide. So we know that the most important thing to do with a completed pad is to share it with trusted supports and treatment providers. Um, as I mentioned before, when a facilitator is helping someone create a pad, they can transfer the data using a secure QR code. The code can be scanned by the client on their own device, or the facilitator can email or text the QR code to be scanned at a later time. When the user creates a pad for themselves, they can create a PDF of their pad uh, completed with signatures and share it via text or email. There are also QR codes at the bottom of the PDF document, so the user can scan scan it and re-upload the pad information in case they get a new phone. Um, lastly, as Amy alluded to, and I want to emphasize again, we were very intentional about the security of data in this app. Nothing ever touches the cloud. When a facilitator uses the QR code to transfer a pad, that only goes from one device to another. No data ever passes through any servers or is logged anywhere. Also, as long as the data is saved in the app, the user can access it at any time to update their pad. Um, the only caveat being that they would have to sign the form again and get new witness signatures if their state requires it. Slide, uh, next slide, please. Um, so when we created, created these slides, the My Mental Health Crisis Plan app had been downloaded more than 7,500 times. You can see the breakdown of iOS and Android downloads. And uh, the app has been most downloaded in California, Massachusetts, and Texas. And with that, I will pass it back to Amy. Next slide. So I think where we want to sort of leverage the expertise on this call is that we've been thinking a lot about a national registry for PADS. We would like to routinize when someone has a mental health crisis that there is a place for that provider to look for the pad. 
in our original thinking, of course, we thought, well, they'll have it on their phone or they will have shared it with somebody. But to really routinize emergency physicians, people who are um, thinking about does this person, what does this person need in their mental health crisis, we really need to routinize a place for them to look for this information. And so I know that there are probably individuals on this call who have thought about this, have pushed this in the past. Um, you know, I talked to David Covington about it. He said, oh, you know, a few years back, we thought about this and we, we didn't get very far. But I feel like this could be our moment. This could be our moment to really routinize being able to keep the pads someplace and being able to train responders to look for it so that the voice of our individuals who are having the crisis is represented. Um, many of the things we found when we were creating this was no one, why should I make this? No one's ever going to look at it. No one's ever going to, no one's ever going to consider it. And, you know, Joanne and I thought, well, there's a little truth to that, you know? So how do we routinize our, our responders to look for this? And one of the, one of the ways I've been thinking about is having it, having everyone's in a place so that we could say, here's where you look. But next slide. I want to um, just say, I'm going to open it up to the round table, but that's sort of where I'm at and where I would love to um, sort of direct the conversation. And I'm, I will be looking through the chat to see if there's any uh, questions I need to answer, but also um, feel free to email me at acohen at psych.org. And I'll turn it back to you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Phenomenal, phenomenal presentation. I, uh, before we turn it to the round table, I just wanted to comment, not a question per se, but a comment that we're getting a lot of positive comments in the chat box that really indicate not only their usage of the site, but how facilitated it is and how much information they're able to gather. So you have a lot of folks on your team with regards to the popularity and the accuracy of this. So uh, kudos to you all. Uh, yeah, we would like to move to now the uh, round table. And uh, representing the round table today, we have uh, Dr. Terry Brister and uh, uh, Charlie Smith from the uh, SAMHSA Region 8 element. I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank All you. Right, Terry. Yeah, Terry, Terry, do you want to go first? Thank you. I was going to say, we didn't talk about who was going to go first, so, so thank you for that. Uh, I appreciated being invited by Amy to join her uh, to provide a response to her presentation. First of all, I've watched the numbers grow on this call, and it thrills me beyond measure to see the level of interest and people getting together to, to address these issues. I am the family engagement expert on the SMI Advisor Project, have been involved with the project from the beginning. I'm the National Director of Research, Support, and Education at NAMI. And one of the things, I want to respond first just to SMI Advisor in general, and I've seen some of the comments in the chat. I was a community mental health clinician for 20 years and would have given anything if something like this had been available then because in school we're really not trained how to handle people with serious mental illness, much less people with serious mental illness in crisis. And what we know, I knew it then, and I've certainly learned it at NAMI, is that many times that's the first place that families and individuals first get exposed to anything. And all too frequently we know their first exposure is not a healthcare professional, but it's frequently a law enforcement professional. Having something like this, whether it, the idea of routinizing pads is phenomenal. Developing crisis plans is something that we preach at NAMI on a regular basis for families and individuals. And I want to add that with SMI Advisor, not just the pads, uh, the crisis app, but the family voice and the individual's voice is always a huge part of everything that's developed, all the resources. And the fact that this app is available on your smartphone, almost everybody has a smartphone and can access it. And the fact that family members can develop a crisis plan as well, I think is, is just phenomenal. So yes, I'm part of SMI Advisor, but I'm also a huge fan and think I would be even if I wasn't. Um, but again, just appreciate the opportunity for this group 
to get a glimpse into what the resources are that are available. Um, Jerry, thanks. And, and this is Charlie Smith and uh, Amy, um, thank you very much. Uh, we are at SAMHSA and clearly here in the Region 8 office, huge SMI advisor fan. So your fan club continues to grow. And, um, uh, and really, again, thank you for the invite. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Dr. Charlie Smith and the Regional Administrator for SAMHSA out here in the Denver office. Um, and, uh, you know, for me as a clinician, um, the, the work that I've been involved in regarding crisis services has been like Terry at the ground level, uh, both here as well as also in New York City, but also through the uh, uh, administration and management being a state director here in Colorado and now with SAMHSA. You know, and kind of thinking about um, this work, um, one, this 988 crisis jam, thinking about a crisis stabilization system, you all are leading um, our efforts for the country and really wanna thank all of you on this call and, and all of the leadership um, that's represented. But for me, I also think about, okay, what are we aspiring to? Uh, we are really aspiring to this equitable and stable person-focused, person-centered healthcare system. Um, and it's one that I frequently talk about how we got to get to a place where we can talk about our emotional and mental struggles in the same way we talk about a sprained ankle, arthritis, and erectile dysfunction. We're not there yet. Um, and I know that we're all trying to move in that direction. But this conversation, the conversation about 988 and crisis services and PAD moves us in that direction. Um, I think really what's cool about the psychiatric advanced directives, it really leverages that person, the patient's voice. It engages their family, it engages their stakeholders. It engages how they want to be treated, particularly in a crisis. Um, and that's really at the cornerstone of when we think about a self-directed, individualized, recovery-oriented system of care. And I really want to applaud the work that is happening, not only in SMI Advisor, but I think about 25 other states that have passed laws with regard to psychiatric advanced directives. Here in Colorado, um, the Psychiatric Advance Directive was passed in 2019. It's House Bill 19-1044 uh, for you policy folks who want to dive into that. But it actually laid out in state law the importance of uh, psychiatric advance directives really to support that individual's voice in their care and has really kind of emphasized the opportunity to link the electronics and link the coordination of healthcare systems uh, and patients and families and providers in a way that's really um, symbiotic and very much focused on, um, on the individual uh, in need. So again, Amy, thank you very much. Great conversation and really look forward to diving into this more. And thanks to both of you uh, for the questions and the review. We do have a couple of questions and a little time here. If you don't mind, Dr. Cohen, I will uh, kind of read you what was listed in the chat box. Uh, one question that was raised is, is the thought of having this accessible to 911 telecommunications and first responders sort of like safety profiles offered through services like Rapid SOS and Smart 911? Is the, is the question, is that a goal? I'm sorry. Um, it seems like they're asking if it is like those uh, examples. If your system is set up like the safety profiles that would be offered in places like Rapid SOS and Smart 911. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know about those. <laughs> so if somebody can tell me about those, I don't think we're set up like that. I mean, we're very separate from that system, but we want to be integrated into crisis response. So I'm not exactly sure if someone could enlighten me, that would be wonderful. Right. And the, the person can email me at acohen yeah, yeah. at psych.org and we could talk more about it to see if there's a way that and, we could make something like that aligned. And thank you for saying that because um, I did want your permission first before we kind of put it out there. But uh, for those that have questions and where we're unable to get to them, uh, and Dr. Cohen, if you're okay with that, uh, yes. have them definitely send it to Yes, many people who've written in the chat, I've been writing down your names, whether you like it or not, and I'm going to contact you to help us think about think through this. So, so I appreciate that. Now, there was another question raised that said, I would love to see, and maybe more of a statement than a question, would love to see a box uh, key that could they could check 
to see if they would want it linked to crisis hubs in the state versus a national registry. Huh, that's a really good idea. And I can imagine, you know, I guess in my fantasy, I was sort of thinking like, if I was at my parents' house in another state and I had a crisis, I would want, if I went to the hospital there, them to be able to access it, even though I'm living in California. But I think that's a really good and might be something that feels more palatable to someone to be able to keep it within the state rather than at the federal level. I think that's a really good idea. And I'm going to write that down um, as another way to think about it. And that's something we could even talk with whoever wrote that in could email me or we could talk with Nashbit about the idea of state level um, registries. Um, and I know someone from Michigan wrote in and said they want to they want to push something like this forward. So I we've been contacted by a couple states. So maybe state level is the first thing to tackle. Very good. And Amy, I, I think I have another one here. Um, I'm confident philanthropy would be interested in helping support the state or a group of states who are interested in the PADs being accessible during a crisis through a registry network where individuals could designate access or restrict to local, state, and or national networks. They're confident that we could make, uh, raise interest from many foundations. So this sounds like a note of support uh, being given. And again, I will say to uh, the person that wrote this, please, uh, she has opened her doors for contact, be in contact with her. And I'm sure she'll be available to discuss that more in detail. Or am I, I taking I, out of your mouth there? <laughs> I put that person's name on my list. Absolutely. But I think that, I think again, everybody's thinking in the same way. What would be, how do we balance what would be palatable to the individual writing the crisis plan and pad versus how can we make sure that that voice is heard at the moment of the crisis? So I think it's good that we're thinking about sort of both perspectives because I think for it ever to be implemented and for there to be uptake, we have to consider both of those. So I really like that, that thinking. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, again, I'm, I'm going over top of a number of positive comments. Uh, yes, and I'll look through them as we, you know, I know you have to move on, but I'm gonna look through the chat and I'm gonna be writing down some names of people to talk to. Excellent. Well, at this point, uh, I don't see any of the additional questions. So Dr. Cohen, again, we want to thank you so, so very much for your presentation. Again, we are very noteworthy compadres in terms of NASPA and your organization. And we have seen firsthand uh, the distinct benefits that have come out of what you have already produced and are continuing to move forward with. And this cannot be more helpful to everyone. I also want to add to it that uh, when I mentioned earlier about the international connections, there's a lot of countries that are looking at that structure and form to see about emulation even outside of the U.S. So it's very much uh, kudos to all of you guys. So I want to thank you again and so glad to have you as part of this discussion today. And thanks, Doc. I think we are ready now to move to our next section. Uh, so we could have our next slide put up, please. We are now getting ready to move into our state updates. And while we're waiting for that to kind of come up, why don't we move first to Stephanie Hepburn as part of our state legislative updates. Uh, Stephanie, if you're on the line, uh, you could come on and talk to us about uh, your discussion with uh, Dr. Aisha Delaney Brumsey. Thank you, Brian. Yes. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Yep. So this week I chatted with Dr. Aisha Delaney Brumsey. She's the Director of Behavioral Health at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. We chatted about COVID, racial justice, police reform and 988 and how communities are redesigning their crisis systems to foster parity. Um, and she talked about how through the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, there are 14 law enforcement mental health learning sites 
that are helping communities build specialized law enforcement responses for mental health, um, also alternative responses or, or address quality of life concerns. Um, Dr. Delaney Brumsey, if you're on the line, if you could share a little bit about the process, how jurisdictions uh, can opt in, what can they do, and how the program matches jurisdictions to the learning site, what that looks like, and also the peer-to-peer -peer resources um, that they provide. Uh, sure, Stephanie, it's really nice to um, be talking with you all today. Uh, similar to um, Amy, I've been a long time, I liked your phrase, Amy, long time lurker, first time presenter. Um, <laughs> so um, it's great to be here. Um, so the law enforcement mental health learning sites, um, as you mentioned, Stephanie, these are 14 communities across the country um, who are willing and have been working to provide peer to support to other jurisdictions across the country who are trying to stand up um, interventions at that law enforcement and behavioral health intersection to reduce unnecessary law enforcement contact, improve health outcomes for people who come into contact with law enforcement. These sites, um, this program got started back in 2010. It's, a, it's supported by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Um, and it was actually expanded this year to include an additional five sites that brought us up to 14. Those sites are from all across the country. They um, and some of actually, I think I saw uh, Dr. Balfour on the phone, a few other folks who themselves are part of this law enforcement mental health learning sites program. Um, but what those sites do is they open their doors for other jurisdictions who are interested in learning about how they came together between law enforcement and behavioral health to think about the interventions that they provide both at that point of the 911 call, but even before that and after that to ensure that anyone with a mental health condition, substance use condition, people experiencing houselessness, um, that the response is effective, compassionate, reduces unnecessary law enforcement contact. Um, and they all have stood up a kind of range of interventions that meet the needs of their local jurisdictions, whether that's co-response team, crisis stabilization unit, um, whether they've embedded clinicians within their 911 call centers. Um, and the key is that they haven't just done one thing, um, mm -hmm. These jurisdictions were selected because they've stood up a number of interventions across their system. So they're trying to shift the way their entire system um, responds in these types of incidents. And so when a community is interested in learning about them, they can come to us, they can come directly to the sites themselves actually, but they often will come to the Justice Center and they'll say, you know, we're thinking about embedding a clinician in our 911 call center and having that person be able to deploy our homeless outreach team. What do you know about another community that's done that? So we might say, well, look at Wichita, Kansas. They're a similar size to you. They have a really strong homeless outreach team. Let's have you have, be on a call with them. Or maybe we'll have them go visit the site and that's completely free of charge. So that's what those sites look like and um, how they're utilized. So Aisha, you mentioned um, it's really, like you said, not just about one component and what you're always hoping is that the conversation leads to more of a systemic response. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, I don't wanna discourage any community wherever you're at. The first mm -hmm. step is the first step, that's important. If you're gonna, you know, your first step might be that you're actually just gonna have a meeting between law enforcement and behavioral health or homeless service providers to sit down and look at your system data and say, what could we need to do? What do we need to do? What is the first problem we're going to tackle? But the fact is that, um, and everyone in the, this virtual room knows this, this is not, a, these are not easy questions to answer. Like how do you reduce unnecessary law enforcement contact? How do you make sure that you can get people into supports that improves their long-term well-being, reduces the likelihood that they go to emergency rooms. That requires a lot of, that requires changing the way your entire system supports people. And so we really look for jurisdictions that have done multiple interconnected interventions um, so that they can, they can coach other communities on how they got started and where they are today. And the fact is that these learning sites are continuing to develop their resources. Many of our sites this year, as you mentioned, you know, they've had co-response teams for a long time. They might've even had crisis intervention teams, which are teams of just specially trained law enforcement officers who respond to mental health calls. Then they built their co-response team where they have a, maybe a social worker and a law enforcement officer 
paired together to respond to calls. And now they're thinking about extending um, and adding in teams where behavioral health professionals are responding to 911 calls. So mobile crisis units that can go quickly to those emergencies. And so those they're constantly learning and um, enhancing the work that they're doing and, and, and building their system to respond to kind of the ever-changing needs of their community. And that's what we want other communities to be thinking about and see that as an example. Brian, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Delaney Brumsey for chatting with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Stephanie. And thanks to both of you for that wonderful presentation. And, and Dr. Delaney Brumsey, I do wanna uh, suggest to you that there was a lot of uh, positive, uh, I guess, vibes for lack of a better word, that's moving in that direction because some of the states that we've talked to have really illustrated that they're so willing and ready to get into that type of connection. And it's just great to see that you're moving that way and all the best as far as how this goes for you and in terms of helping others. Uh, thank you so much to both of you. And let's move to the next slide, please. Great, thank you. Um, we're now moving to uh, the SAMHSA portion and I'm not really certain if either Anita or John are available on the call, but if there are any other representatives from SAMHSA who are on the call, please open your lines at this time. Um, hi, uh, Brian, this is Jason. Um, I, uh, hi, Jason. Anita, <laughs> how are you? Um, so Anita and uh, John both are off today. Um, um, so uh, I don't think there is any other updates that I can provide today. Yeah. We'll and definitely provide uh, updates next week. I know Richard is there. So Richard, you wanted to give any updates, please feel free to. Sure, I would, I, 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 would be, I would be happy to. So there are, um, there are a number of continuing areas of activity that's important to be aware of. Um, and I'll, I'll just mention a couple of them. We had the first um, meeting of the um, 988 working group that's part of the suicide prevention and crisis care subcommittee of the US Department of Health and Human Services uh, Behavioral Health Coordinating Committee. Now I know that's a mouthful, but it's also something that is quite um, is quite important because I think that this is the strongest effort to unify all of the operating divisions and staff divisions as part of the US Department of Health and Human Services around suicide prevention and crisis care. Uh, that, that subcommittee is headed by our assistant secretary and the CDC director, Rachel Walensky. And we have now drilled down to work specifically on 988 within that venue. Um, that, that work group is co-chaired by myself and also by Ellen Blackwell, uh, from, uh, from CMS. Um, also, and Anita mentioned this, um, I think in the last week or two, uh, but you know, we had a great um, um, effort uh, looking at children's crisis services. Melinda Baldwin from CMHS really was a leader in pulling that, uh, in pulling that together. Uh, you know, that took place and we're, we're looking to continue to deepen the importance uh, focus of the role of children and youth within a transformed crisis center. And you know, it certainly appears that um, there are increases in suicidal ideation uh, during this COVID period uh, among uh, youth. We know a CDC report had a 50%, it's pretty staggering, a 50% increase in suicide attempts being seen in emergency departments for girls age 12 to 17. So um, I think the Melinda Baldwin's leadership on that and Dr. Everett's leadership on that um, is really an important piece. There's so much going on with 988, obviously, uh, that SAMHSA is engaged in. It would take the rest of the time to go over all of it, but we promise to keep all of you um, informed. And Tyson has been doing great work at overseeing the, um, uh, the set aside for the mental health block grant um, uh, as, as states have, um, you know, begun to, to really work toward implementation of that. 
Well, Dr. McKeon, thank you so much for that. I did have a question that was raised in the chat box. It was asking, uh, how can one access the report that's been submitted to Congress? And can the public view these meetings? If so, how can you access them? Okay, so in terms of the reports, I presume that the question is about the reports to Congress um, that were required under the Hotline Designation Act. Those are not available yet. Um, those are, are currently, they have both been submitted through the federal clearance process. And uh, so we are hoping that um, that process will be finished shortly and they will be transmitted to Congress. And once they are transmitted at, to Congress, we will then you know, begin to actively look to how we can share them uh, with, with, uh, with stakeholders. But right now they are, they are still in the clearance process there. They have been, you know, SAMHSA has, continue, has finished its work, put it into the clearance process, we're now waiting for feedback back, then it will go to the Hill. Okay, thank you, Doc. There was also a question, is there a way to get involved with the group focusing on children's systems? I would suggest that if anybody's interested, um, you're free to send me an email at, at uh, richard.mckeon, M-C-K-E-O-N, at samsa.hhs.gov. Um, and I will get that information to uh, uh, Melinda Baldwin, who has really been the lead on, on moving that forward. Um, I think it's really highly likely that there will be some additional pieces of, of, of effort in there. And it's great to know about who uh, would like to be involved, participate and help with this vitally important effort. So you can get, oh, the other thing you can do is um, I, you know, I try to be on uh, these calls whenever possible. You can certainly contact me through the chat and I'll try to copy down your information. Great. And Dr. McKeon, thank you so much. Uh, one last thing before you go. Uh, if you're looking at the slide right now, I was wondering if you uh, were aware and could address this particular slide involving the AmeriCorps state and national public health uh, funding priority, are you? Yeah, so the, um, the, so we are aware of this. I personally just became um, aware of it uh, relatively recently. So our 988 team has been looking at this and looking at it, uh, you know, for um, its potential and, um, and uh, distributing the information so that people, groups such as our local crisis centers who participate in the Lifeline Network um, are aware of it as, um, as an opportunity. I also uh, see that there's a question in the chat that would most appropriately be directed toward Thiessen. Yeah, I did see that uh, from Kristen. Uh, Kristen, uh, yes, you know, we, we received uh, plans from every state and territory related to the crisis stabilization programs. Uh, but one of the things we learned is that states are quickly uh, evolving in terms of what they are doing with the crisis stabilization program. So what they submitted in March may not be the case right now. Um, they may there may be changes, uh, but we are also tracking what states are doing and um, uh, we can definitely you know, uh, give you an aggregate uh, uh, kind of information as to where states are. Um, also to the fact that uh, um, uh, NRI, um, I know Ted is on the call. They are also doing, uh, they're also working with states in terms of tracking um, where the crisis stabilization and mobile crisis teams are in, in, in terms of uh, implementation. Uh, Ted, uh, you wanted to say something about that? Uh, sure, yes, we've been working at the Nashville Research Institute with the states um, and have a report that should be um, public in the next week or so, looking at um, the crisis continuum that each of the states are supporting. Um, and that's just going through its final review. We have our steering committee meeting tomorrow afternoon. And we've also been doing a study. We worked with a number of states looking at how states, um, existing call centers, hotlines, warm lines are working with 911 and 
transitioning to 988, and we'll be having a report coming out on that shortly as well. Thank you all again for a very comprehensive report. Um, I think at this point we're going to move on. Um, I'm going to do highlight for NASPIT a recent meeting that took place uh, between NASPIT and our alliance with the IIMHL and the WIDL. And IIMHL is the International Initiative on Mental Health Leadership. And they also have a sister division of the International Initiative on Disability Leadership. And uh, we have been affiliated with them for quite some time. Those not familiar with the IIMHL, it's an uh, international organization representing about 22 uh, countries. And they have regular meetings that involve uh, a updates and uh, matches and different annualized or biannual meetings. Uh, just an update to let you know that they have planned to have their next international meeting. We had the last one in 2019 in Washington, D.C., and the nations all came to Washington, D.C., and Nashville, SAMHSA, and uh, the IIMHL had sponsored that particular um, overview. Uh, the next one is going to occur in Christchurch, New Zealand. And the original plan was that all would converge on Christchurch, New Zealand in February of 2022. And there would be a week long meeting that would be held there. Uh, because of COVID and because of restrictions, they've been revised now to where that meeting will not take place in February of 2022 because they are currently on lockdown and they don't know how long that's going to persist. It's now been moved to October of 2022 and they are also going to be doing a mixed format where there'll be some in-house and there will also be a virtual format for those that are comfortable with either side of it. Uh, it will be hosted by Christchurch, uh, New Zealand. Uh, it is something to really look forward to if you all are not familiar with IIMHL, you can go into IIMHL.com. Uh, membership in it is free, and it affords you the opportunity to really get an international flavor for the things that are going on uh, across our nations that are paralleling the types of struggles and more so the efforts and resources that are available to us all. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and move on quickly. Um, got a few more to go here. Uh, Dr. McKeon, are you still on the line, sir? Uh, yes, I am. Oh, wonderful, because this is your portion, sir. <laughs> if you recall from the last time, I think Laura had put you through our Who Wants to Be a Millionaire format of the uh, Crisis Trivia Hotline, and I just wanted to see if you're available to uh, go through this round with me very quickly. Well, I didn't know I had a monopoly on um, <laughs> on this role, but I'm happy to give it a shot. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, we're going to do it in the same format as Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And I'll pose the question to you. Uh, and you will have options, of course. You can phone a friend or you could ask the audience in terms of an answer. And then we'll go ahead and go through it. So in 2016, the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention Crisis Service Task Force published a framework that featured three core services that would serve as the chassis for SAMHSA's national guidelines for behavioral crisis care in 2021, okay? Uh, next slide. The question that we're raising is which state most inspired the three element model mirroring, the 911 EMS ambulance and hospital ED systematic approach of emergency medical care? And uh, we go to the uh, next slide, yes. Uh, with the three components listed, someone to call, someone to come to you, some place to go and stay. So the question, Dr. McCann, is which state most inspired this in terms of these three elemental models? Okay, so let me, let me just start by saying that the framing of someone to call, someone to come to you, and some place to go and stay uh, came from uh, was the vision of Dr. Anita Everett. Um, and, um, um, and so I wanna give full credit to her Excellent. for that easily understandable way of framing 
the key elements of the of the model. And before I answer the question about which state, I think there are a number of states that ha are doing great work um, in this arena, uh, ranging from Connecticut. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our assistant secretary who had recently been the commissioner there. But the answer to your question about which state most inspired the three elemental model, I would say that um, that would likely be uh, Georgia um, with their um, Georgia crisis and access line links and links to mobile outreach. Righty. Well, in the interest of time, is that your final answer, sir? That is my final answer. <laughs> okay. Well, then we'll go ahead and post the answer. Oh, okay. Actually, Governor Hickenlooper ran the Colorado legislature. So thank Very you. good. And but <laughs> Colorado did not implement the full model. So that's a but that's a great point there. Um, there that was in, included in their initial funding announcement there. So great point. You stumped me. <laughs> Not me, sir. But <laughs> same token in the check box, I will let you know that Georgia really liked your response. <laughs> so let's move on to uh, national initiative, Sarah, if you're on the line. If I could get you very quickly to give us a kind of an overview, you and Natalie. Yeah, and I'll be very quick. If we can go to the next slide, uh, this next 24 to 48 hours, there's a lot going on. Uh, so I'll just quickly flag that we are coming up to the deadline to start fiscal year 22 and still do not have any uh, uh, new funding uh, for FY22 signed into law. So uh, we're looking to see if the continuing resolution gets over the line by midnight uh, going into Friday. And there's also ongoing uh, debate around the raising the debt ceiling, which uh, looks like it, we've got another few weeks for that. And then um, the reconciliation package is kind of taking a bit of a backseat uh, given the next uh, 48 hours and what we have to get done uh, to keep the government open. So hopefully we'll have a better update next week, but uh, a lot going on in the Hill and um, you know, hoping we can get through this and then uh, be able to go back to some of these uh, priorities. Of course, very important to keep the government open and debt ceiling um, being raised. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the brevity, but thank you for that information. Uh, can we ask if Paul is on the line? Paul, would you like to just say a few words with regards to uh, the calculator? Sure, thank you, Brian. Um, I would just mention, look, last week we talked about 20 states receiving awards to advance their mobile crisis services. And those that have gotten on the calculator, which is on that crisisnow.com website under tools that NASBIT operates, uh, you would see that, look, we project roughly a typical state of 6.5 million people would have a $15 million spend on mobile crisis services for their 55 teams. But of course, the state general fund is 7.1 million largely based on that 85% enhanced federal match that we've seen come through. But this is, look, it's a spreadsheet, Brian, we know this, and not everyone shares my love for spreadsheets. So I do want to announce, uh, we have uh, engaged a fantastic partner in McKinsey and Company Center for Societal Benefit for Healthcare. And we're working on a version 2.0, which is going to be more of a web-based platform that's going to offer a whole lot more flexibility it's going to look at what you have now and where you're trying to go and structure those things in a way that I think is going to be much more user friendly. So at least wanted to introduce that's coming. But right now we still have the spreadsheet on crisisnow.com. All right. Well, thank you so much. And in the interest of time, because we're right up at the end of the time, uh, if you'll go to the um, last slide with the coming soon, please. There we go. Just wanted to bring to everyone's attention what is heading our way, uh, where we have Dr. Mancini coming in with language and culture on October 6th. We're also looking at Dr. Mark Reagan's on uh, focusing and recovery, especially in crisis on the 13th, and all of the other wonderful uh, speakers that we have lined up for each and every one of you. Um, I am so thankful to all the participants today. I'm thankful to all of you who come on board and been a part of this. Please uh, thank you again for joining us for this week's session, and hopefully you will have a fruitful, productive week 
and we'll look forward to seeing each and every one of you on next week. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us.